I sensed then, and this belief would grow as the years went on, that the lifeblood of the movement was not going to be the spokesman, the schooled, sophisticated, savvy upper crust who might be best at speech making and press conferences. They would be the leaders, naturally, but it was going to be the tens of thousands of faceless, nameless, anonymous men, women, and children. Men like my father, women like my mother, children like the boy I had been who were going to rise like an irresistible army as this movement for civil rights took shape. That's a quote by John Lewis, who was one of the founding members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the civil rights movement in this country. It's something that I go back to when I think about what's happening right now inside of Iran. There's been some debate today, and there certainly has been prior to today, about what this is. If it's a populist movement, who these people are, what brings people to the streets, and why. Is it a movement? People are certainly moving inside of Iran. So I think it is undisputed that there has been some socio-political change and climate in the country. So it's imperative for us not only to understand the transformative significance of a day that would bring people to the streets, but to grasp the evolution of Iranian political consciousness within Iran and its, and its diaspora leading up to it. If as a diaspora community, we accept responsibility, and responsibility of contextualizing the movement within Iran, we have to fully grasp the weight and the breadth of that responsibility. Uh, my colleagues have spoken a little bit about the various communities, the clerical, the clerics, the arts and cultural community within Iran. The next panel, I think Hadi Ghaimi from the International Campaign for Human Rights is gonna speak about the deteriorating human rights condition and the people who have been most affected by it. Danny Postel and others on the prior panel spoke about the seeds of uprising nearly a decade ago in the student resistance movement after being suppressed. But I think even more strikingly, if we just look at a broad overview of what society has looked like, According to UNICEF, from 1990 to 2007, there's been an aver average annual rate of inflation of nearly 23% inside of Iran. According to the Middle East Economic Survey conducted in 2007, unemployment is especially high at about 34% among people 15 to 24 years of age who officially constitute 25% of the labor force. About 60% of university students are women. However, the progress in women's education has not been matched in any way with an increase in female employment. If women in Iran seek divorce, child custody of the children is automatically granted at the age of seven and beyond to the, to the father. Iran itself is second only to China in the rate of executions. And the rampant attacks on human rights institutions and NGOs in Iran uh, have increased dramatically over the last two years or so. In 2008, even Nobel laureate Shirin Abadi's uh, Center for Human Rights Defenders was shut down, raided and shut down. So I give you this sort of uh, broad overview or bird's eye view of certain elements of society and, and realities that lead or inform the movement that we're talking about or the people that we're talking about. Hopefully what they do, I think, is inform us, people who in the, solidar in the global international community want to contribute in some way, shape, or form to a solidarity movement. It's absolutely necessary, if we wish, to be in touch with the realities and the facts that surround Iran, that we're honest, that we're flexible, that we do not deny certain elements and belief systems that still exist within Iran's borders, and that we do not only try to adhere to the rhetoric and speech of those who are the most aligned with our own ideologies. This would be a disservice to the movement and to the people that we claim to stand behind. 
I can sp I want to speak more specifically from an international standpoint of the United States because that's obviously my vantage point and the one that I'm most familiar and intimate with. Uh, the Iranian American community really, you know, burgeoned in, in 1979 following the revolution. At that time, um, most of the people who immigrated here were those who were either the most educated, financially capable, had the most ties or connections to the U.S. in part because they had previously studied here, um, creating sort of the first wave or influx of individuals of a certain element or class of Iranian society. And upon arrival, this didn't transform in a really politicized or action-oriented diaspora. You didn't actually see the establishment of any Iran-oriented political lobby groups or anything like that until much more recently. In fact, there was a census done in 2000 that estimated that only 338,000 individuals of Iranian-American descent lived in the United States. And the true belief or estimate is that that number is two to three times that number. Um, and this is often used as a way or a justification of showing that Iranian Americans are, re are very assimilated here. They're very comfortable and, and, and natural. I think what happened, what I bore witness to, was that after 9-11, there was a, a severe and dramatical change in that understanding. Um, and this was in large part because of the effect of uh, national policy, security policy, that the Bush administration put forth that directly affected people of Iranian descent um, and immigrants in this country. I'm just going to give you a couple examples of that. One was the NSEERS, or Special Registration Program, that began on September 11th of 2002. The program actually required non-immigrant male nationals from approximately 25 countries, including Iran, which was actually categorized as one of the top five um, priority countries, to report to local immigration and naturalization services in order to be questioned, photographed, and fingerprinted. Um, people appeared to these interviews voluntarily, quote unquote. Um, the INS website at the time, the naturalization services, was completely unclear or ambiguous about what the purpose of this program was and what the ramifications for this voluntary interview would actually be. Uh, and there was actually no indication of what would even happen to people who held legal, let alone illegal, status in this country at that time. What you saw was that you, the INS itself had no actual plan for what it intended to do with many people. People who came in who had legitimate legal status in this country or who had pending applications for residency, which by extension grants you a legal status in this country, found themselves in detention, um, many for up to 72 hours before they had contact with friends or family. And there was no, as I mentioned, there was no uh, community-based organizations or entities within the Iranian community to respond to these things, because this isn't something that the community here had actually prepared for or understood in the past. So many of these entities actually formed um, immediately or united with uh, organizations that worked with Middle East Muslim, Southeast Asian, or Arab communities to do, this, to do the work on behalf of Iranians. I personally at the time volunteered uh, at the Council on American Islamic Relations and actually litigated cases in the aftermath of some of the policies that were implemented on immigrant procedural